I'm back. Uh, thank you for staying subscribed. If you're still subscribed, if you're new here, uh, welcome. Glad to have you here. Uh, my name is Corey. Uh, I am a professor of English and I teach folklore classes, classes on all kinds of things, including uh, classes on uh, uh, monsters of literature. That's what I'm doing this semester that I, I really enjoy. Um, also the author of a book called New World Witchery. Uh, I've been doing a podcast for over a decade focusing on North American folk magic and witchcraft. Um, and so that's largely what this channel is about. That's largely what you find out about here. Uh, today, um, I wanted to talk to you about one specific regional branch of folk magic and get into kind of some, some of the sort of basics, the, the hows, the whys, the whats, uh, wherefores, all that about uh, Ozark folk magic, because I think that's one that people recognize uh, in the mix, but they don't always know exactly what it means or what kind of is connected to it and how it how it works. So I'll start by saying I am not uh, a native Ozarker. I don't live in the Ozarks. Um, I'm fairly close. I'm actually closer to the Appalachians. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit, I think, about there being some overlap between Appalachian and Ozark folkways. But the Ozarks themselves um, are their own distinct cultural region. I am only an outsider. Uh, kind of looking at the sources that are available uh, based on some of the things that have been collected over the years, as well as the people that I've talked to from that region as, as well, and kind of learning what they're willing to share and what they're willing to offer. But you shouldn't take what I say as um, gospel. Uh, that would be uh, completely egregious to do that. Uh, definitely, if you're talking to somebody from the Ozarks, listen to what they have to say. Uh, they're probably going to have a lot better insights than I will. Um, but if you're just kind of wanting to know a little bit about this region sort of at a surface level and get some idea of what sort of magic you might find there um, and maybe find some resources that would be good to learn more. Um, that's what this video is for and that's what this video is all about. Should probably start with what are the Ozarks? Uh, some people don't even know what they are. Um, it's a mountainous region that is located largely in Arkansas and Missouri. There's a little bit in um, Oklahoma, a little bit in Kansas as well. Peaks, if you're used to thinking of mountains like the Himalayas or mountains like the Rockies. These are more rounded top peaks. That means that they're a good bit older. Um, they're similar to the Appalachians, but they are a little different. There's a lot of cave systems actually in the Ozarks. Uh, that's one of the things that they're best known for, these caves. They have hot springs as well, a lot of groundwater um, that kind of exists underneath them. Um, there's a number of uh, indigenous species uh, there. So for example, deer, skunks, bats, foxes. And you also have some really unique species, some things like uh, cave fish, uh, which are sort of blind um, aquatic creature, uh, as well as you have a type of hellbender salamander uh, as well that lives in the Ozarks. Um, in terms of the botanical makeup of the region, uh, it has a lot of what we would find in sort of deciduous North American forests. Um, so for example, you have things like wild uh, raspberries, black raspberries, um, you have morel mushrooms, you have kind of your, your typical uh, oak, uh, maple, poplar, those kinds of trees in that area. You also have some uh, species that are a little more eastern regional. So for example, the pawpaw, uh, which is a kind of a, it's a very banana-y, pudding-y flavored fruit um, that you can uh, find in both the Appalachians all the way up to the Ozarks and a few other places as well. They also have ginseng. There's ginseng that grows there. That's Sorry, I had to pause because my dog was drinking water and it's a very loud process. All right, so what about the people of the Ozarks? Um, well, in pre-Columbian, pre-contact, pre-colonization history, um, we have a number of indigenous peoples uh, that we know have inhabited that area. So for example, um, we have the Pawnee, uh, Shawnee, um, the Kickapoo, the Choctaw, uh, the Osage uh, tribes all uh, have inhabited that area over time. Actually, kind of um, just to the northeast of the Ozarks, you have one of the great um, indigenous settlements, indigenous uh, cities, really, um, Cosmopolitan Crossroads for North America, which was Cahokia, um, which was basically the New York uh, of, of, its, of its time. Uh, you know, dozens and dozens of tribes uh, did commerce there, exchanged, uh, exchanged goods and and cultural information there. So it was a massive city. There's still, um, you can still go visit. It's just um, outside of St. Louis, I believe, kind of towards the, the west of St. Louis, um, which again is just at sort of the upper edge of the Ozarks. Um, so a lot of indigenous history here. Um, and then once uh, Europeans uh, began colonizing the area, um, you had a few different peoples that wound up settling in this area. 
initially you had uh, a little bit of English incursion into this area, but a lot of the people who settled here were the Scots Irish. Now the Scots Irish, um, there's some confusion about about who they are uh, with a lot of folks. They are um, they are people from sort of parts of Scotland that were resettled uh, by the English into Northern Ireland. Um, spent a couple generations in Northern Ireland, um, and then oftentimes would go and resettle other places, uh, including in large portions of North America. So um, there's a lot of Scots-Irish folks that uh, wound up settling in the Appalachians, for example, uh, across kind of what we call the Upland South, uh, which is sort of Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, that area again, Southern Indiana, Southern Ohio, those areas. Um, and they made their way over to the Ozarks. So there's a number of Scots-Irish folks um, who were bringing uh, Scottish customs, some Irish customs, some English customs along with them. And then much of that would begin to sort of uh, meet and mingle with indigenous uh, indigenous knowledge. So a lot of the plant knowledge from that area came from uh, indigenous people sharing their information with um, those who were colonizing the Ozarks. And uh, sometimes there were positive relationships as much as there you know, could be positive relationships at that time. And, and of course, there were plenty of wars and conflicts as well. So I don't want to whitewash that or gloss over it either. I should also say the Trail of Tears uh, eventually came through the Ozarks uh, as, as the Cherokee and other tribes were being uh, resettled out uh, towards the Oklahoma uh, territories. Um, but there's been a lot of people kind of coming and going through this area. So there's a lot of different influences. Um, and of course, there's also African-American influence because uh, Arkansas uh, and Missouri both had a number of slaveholders uh, who held uh, African folks in um, in bondage in those areas, uh, kept them in slavery. And I should also say the, the Ozarks were a good place for um, when uh, African Americans escaped from slavery. Sometimes they would find their way into the Ozarks again because there are lots of places to hide. There's lots of um, caves and valleys and things like that that made it a little more difficult to track them down. So you do have African American settlements that form there. Um, Tony Morrison has a novel called Paradise, uh, which is really interesting that talks about African-American settlement over more towards Oklahoma, but kind of dealing with some of this sort of escaping from um, the, the systems of slavery. Now, of course, Missouri famously is part of the Missouri Compromise uh, that was, you know, admitting Missouri to the United States as a slave state. So there was a strong push to maintain slavery in these regions. Uh, and so it was not a safe place for African-Americans by and large, but um, there were places, pockets where African-Americans were able to establish uh, really good, strong communities um, and develop uh, strong cultural connections to the area, too. So you have, um, you know, Scots-Irish, you have a little bit of English, you have African-American, you have indigenous um, tribal knowledge all mingling together. And a few other things, too. Every once in a while, you have some German settlements uh, that would pop up, uh, or German settlers that would kind of move into the region, too. So you get little bits of that um, floating around in there, too. You would be much more uh, likely to find, for example, a Himmelsbriefen, which is a, a heaven letter, a uh, type of printed letter that um, was carried around for protection or placed in the home for protection. Uh, you'd be more likely to find that in parts of the northern Appalachians than you would to find that in the Ozarks, um, just because the, the German population in the Northern Appalachians was much larger. So that kind of gets us into, you know, we, that's the history of some sort of the region, um, geologically, botanically, um, biologically, and uh, sort of broadly, culturally speaking, obviously there's a lot more to this um, that I can get into here. But what about the folk magic component? Well, as I said, um, you're going to find some German-influenced uh, magic here, but most of it's going to be things that are coming out of Scots, Irish, and English traditions, meeting indigenous knowledge about the plants and African-American practices um, that uh, you know vary, vary kind of depending on uh, where, where you are and uh, what group you're interacting with. Um, not, not a ton of um, Catholic uh, African-American history here, even though um, this isn't that far away from moving up the river from New Orleans, for example. Um, but most of the influences here are going to be more Protestant, uh, for example, Methodist. You have a lot of um, Methodist uh, influence in this region. All right. So then, like, what are the types of magic here? We sometimes sort of hear this label as mountain magic and grouped with Appalachian folk practices. Um, there's some truth to that in that the Appalachians and the Ozarks share some common DNA with their practices. But uh, the Ozarks are distinct. They have their own flavor of magic. And some of the, the, the workings that you find in the Ozarks are very much found, uh, if not only there, primarily there, or that's where we can really trace them to. Um, so, for example, one of the big things that happens in the Ozarks is beekeeping. Uh, beekeeping 
uh, was a good way to make sure that you had um, sugar and, and supplies for your family and yourself and something that you could trade, something that you could sell uh, as well. So beekeeping was a major practice um, in the Ozarks. Um, so you have traditions like telling the bees. Uh, telling the bees is something that is done when a member of the family dies. You would go out and tell your hives that the, that, that person was gone because you didn't want the, the bees to be insulted or upset uh, by finding out some other way than being told directly. You wanted to show them enough respect um, for their uh, their participation in sort of your family, your household, your, your farm. Um, that you would tell them that this person had died and otherwise they would fly away uh, and you didn't want that to happen because you needed the bees to to produce the honey right um there's also a lot of uh, honey or honeycomb based uh cures and traditions and practices so for example i've got one here it says um if you have a sinus meaning a sinus condition you can chew a piece of honeycomb about the size of a piece of gum for about 15 minutes every few hours uh for a week and take two teaspoons of honey at every meal and that will help clear up your sinuses and i should say none of this is provided as medical advice. This is all folkloric examples so that you have a sense of um, the kind of folklore circulating in the area. Another cure uh, remedy says that you take two teaspoons of vinegar and two teaspoons of honey in a glass of water uh, with each meal, and that will help uh, reduce things like high blood pressure. So if you were experiencing a lot of um, headaches or um, you know pressure in your chest, things like that, um, you might do that as a way to sort of mitigate your blood pressure. Uh, so we see that kind of work there. Uh, we see a lot of herbal cures uh, and tonics. Spring tonics are a big thing uh, where you'll find people that are using um, specific greens. Ginseng is one of these uh, that will help purify your blood or clear out your blood after a long winter. Uh, we see that quite a bit. Um, so some of it is very similar to what we find in the Appalachians. You see the Foxfire books here behind me. Those are about the Appalachians. Um, but there, uh, there's some distinctive sort of elements to these as well. So the, the cures that you find here are going to be more regionally specific to the Ozarks. We use hot springs. Uh, hot springs as a cure-all or a curative. People will go and bathe in hot springs or collect the water from the hot springs to use later uh, as a curative uh, or as a sort of, again, a tonic to sort of purify you uh, and get rid of um, harmful influences, um, both medically and magically. That's uh, sort of thought to kind of work both ways. Uh, it, you know, why, why do one when you can do both, right? And so the flavor of Ozark's magic uh, oftentimes has to do with um, curing diseases or dealing with maladies uh, because um, medical treatment is difficult to come by for a long period of time because there's not a lot of doctors in the area. Um, getting them to you can be tricky. Um, roads can be difficult to, to pass, things like that. Um, they can also be expensive uh, at times. Uh, even, even doctors who work on the barter system, you know, you have to have something to, to trade um, for your care. So there's there's some a lot of less sort of curative things that you're trying to sort of take care of problems on your own. Um, there are, of course, love spells. We find love spells. One that's really interesting uh, that I found in Ozark uh, uh, folk magical uh, writings, uh, which I'll get to in a minute, some examples of those, uh, would be to take a turkey uh, wishbone, or uh, you can use a chicken wishbone too, but, uh, but young people in the Ozarks would take these wishbones um, and if they were, uh, young women would usually try to do this if they were trying to catch the attention of a suitor, um, they would put the wishbones up above their doors, uh, and the doors would be a, a love drawing charm or a way of sort of indicating that they were uh, on the lookout for a bow, right, or a lookout for, uh, for somebody to, to take an interest in them. So you do have charms like that that are fairly distinct, uh, fairly distinctive. There are a few other types of practices. There was an interesting essay, a folklorist uh, who did a really interesting photo essay um, back in, I believe it was the 60s, uh, where he took some black and white photographs and wrote about some of the traditions. One of them was telling the bees. Um, and I'm going to talk about this folklore in a second, but one of the things he chronicled was the use of um, a Bible and some dolls and some spells. So we see uh, some influence there, uh, poppet magic and things like that um, that show up in the Ozarks too. So uh, a lot of different traditions kind of coming together here in the Ozarks, um, but they do take on their own sort of distinct character uh, as well. So what do you do if you want to know a little more about Ozark folk magic? Where do you turn for this? Because it is uh, one of the reasons that there's so many misconceptions, I think, about this and so much difficulty kind of understanding, you know, what is Ozark folk magic is that there's not a ton of uh, recorded material about it. That being said, some really excellent recorded material does exist about it. Um, there's just not a lot of it. The first thing I'm going to tell you about, though, is uh, probably one of the best known pieces of 
Ozark folklore uh, records. And that is a book called Ozark Magic and Folklore by a fellow named Vance Randolph. Now, Vance Randolph was a folklorist working in the 30s, the, the 40s. He and his wife, Mary Ellen Parler, did a ton of research in the Ozark region and collected a lot of this material. Uh, his wife was more interested in, for example, ballads and music, but she did a lot of the collecting too. She did a lot of the interviews and, and found a lot of information out. Um, Randolph as well did a ton of interviews, uh, talked to a lot of people, got a lot of interesting information and collected it all down. Um, he's, this is not his only book. He's got several books on Ozark uh, folklore. So for example, there's one called Pissing in the Snow that's more about actual stories that are in circulation or jokes, uh, humorous anecdotes, things like that. He did a lot of work there. Uh, this book is, it's an excellent book if you're wanting to learn a little bit about Ozark uh, magic uh, and folk belief. It's also sometimes under the title Ozark Superstitions. If you find the older version of it, they're basically the same book. There's not much difference between them, just a few little editorial changes. Um, this one you can usually find fairly cheaply in the you know, 10 to $20 range. You can find it used sometimes for like 2 or $3. Uh, you can sometimes find it um, through Dover. Dover has an imprint of this that once you have all the like, uh, you know, $2 versions of Shakespeare and things like that, they have a copy of this that you can purchase as well. Um, it was originally published, I believe, by University of Chicago Press, Columbia, I'm sorry. Uh, it was originally published by Columbia University Press. Uh, and so it was an academic publication, but then it got picked up as a sort of popular publication because people were interested uh, in folklore and particularly folklore in parts of North America. So now Randolph's work is great. It, there's a lot of really good stuff in there that you can uh, find. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are some some really interesting charms that he has uh, where he talks about, for example, uh, power doctors, which uh, are the sort of people who can cure magical maladies and things like that. Uh, talks about a lot of household superstitions, things like if you drop a rag on the floor, means companies coming, things, just all kinds of really interesting superstitions in folklore. But importantly, uh, Randolph didn't always get everything right. And partly that's because his people that he was interviewing sometimes didn't tell him everything. Uh, they didn't always trust him. They saw him as sort of an outsider. Uh, and because of that, a lot of the information was a little uh, sparse or you, you get half the story, not the whole story where they tell him something, but not everything. Um, and so because of that, uh, it's, it's it's a great place to sort of start off looking at Ozark folk magic. Um, I should also say it's it's very specific to a time period as well. You're really talking about the Great Depression to uh, the 1960s, really. That's the, the snapshot that he gives you is folklore and folk practices from that time period. Um, and it's great. It's a really good book for, for finding out about that. But of course, the Ozarks still exist. People still live there, have been living there, uh, and have had their own traditions and ways and lives since Randolph did his interviews, which means it is a continually growing and evolving and changing place. And so because of that, while Randolph is a wonderful source, um, you shouldn't treat him as the definitive last word on Ozark practices, um, just as somebody who's got a good sort of introduction to, to these practices. If you're looking for somebody who's a little more of an insider, um, who can provide you a lot of kind of insight. Uh, one person I would recommend is a fellow named uh, Brandon Weston. Uh, Brandon Weston uh, has written a couple of books on Ozark folklore and folk magic. This one is called the Ozark Magic, uh, Ozark Mountain Spell Book. There's another one that is called Ozark Folk Magic, just Ozark Folk Magic. That um, I would recommend that one before you do the spell book uh, because the folk magic book gives you a better overview of kind of how all the spells work, how all the magic works. Um, he's really good at kind of looking at, for example, um, the way that astrology is thought about in the area, which is not necessarily uh, thinking about like your sun sign and your horoscope in the newspaper or anything like that, but really about tracking the interactions of moon, uh, lunar passage through specific signs in the way that maps onto the body, um, because that tells you something about what's going on around you. Um, he's a really good writer, really uh, gifted writer, and he's also a native Ozarker. He has been teaching uh, about Ozark traditions. He's even got a little TED talk that he did at a regional TED festival in the Ozarks talking about Ozark healing traditions. And that's actually, his, he runs a website called Ozark Healing, where he talks about these kind of Ozark-based regional practices and traditions. So he's a really, really effective source for a lot of that information. I, I highly recommend him. Uh, if you can get get a copy of his book, um, it should be pretty widely available. Um, I would say, you know, he updates a lot of the stuff that Randolph missed. I remember sitting 
um, around with uh, a woman who was part of a band of Ozark folk musicians, basically Ozark bluegrass musicians. Uh, one night and we were talking about Vance Randolph and she said, you know, um, you know, he, we told him a lot of things, but we didn't tell him everything um, because there's a protectiveness about uh, the culture in the region because it can be misconstrued and misconceived. A lot of people have bring negative opinions about the Ozarks uh, or people there. Um, and so there was sort of some some walls that uh, that were put up uh, between Randolph and uh, the folks of the, uh, the of the Ozarks. Uh, Weston, as a native Ozarker, doesn't have to deal with that as much because he is from the area. He knows the region and he knows uh, what the practices in the area are. I mean, he's speaking from a very kind of authentic place of trying to recover a lot of this material. He's also got a really good essay in another forthcoming book, uh, which uh, makes me seem like a shameless plug, but I'm just going to mention it because if you want kind of uh, a flavor of it while looking at other North American folk magic systems, this book is going to be coming out here in the next few months. This is North American Folk Magic, Blue Wellness Complete Book of North American Folk Magic. Um, I am the editor. You can see my name there on it. Um, this is an advanced copy, obviously. But he's got a chapter in here where he talks about Ozark folk magic, and he talks about some of these challenges um, that came with uh, Randolph and Mary Ellen Parler doing what they did, and uh, and sort of how how they sort of did capture it at a specific time, but that's it. that sort of left it very stagnant. People don't understand that it's continued to grow and evolve since then. And it's a very vibrant um, and bustling region uh, of the country with a lot of things going on. So if you want a little sort of short taste of that, um, the, the Llewellyn Complete book is a good way to get a taste of that and then look at some other systems as well. Um, but if you want to go a little deeper with it, uh, I would definitely say <clears throat> get Weston's books, uh, get Randall's book as well, uh, and check that out because that gives you a good sort of rounded comparison. And then the other thing, and I'll put a link to all these books in our um, description, and I'll also put a link to this next thing as well, and that is the magazine Bittersweet. Um, now, Bittersweet is is basically kind of like what Foxfire did for the Appalachians, um, Bittersweet did for the Ozarks. So Foxfire was uh, a project where High school students went out and interviewed uh, locals from the region to sort of collect lore so that it wouldn't get lost and so they could put it all down. It was basically a magazine that then got compiled into a bunch of books. Bittersweet has not been compiled into a bunch of books. Bittersweet has remained a magazine, but it only ran for a short period of time. However, all of the issues are available online through one of the regional libraries, so you can go and find a lot of information. That's actually where I got um, some of those honey cures, the, the, the bee-based cures, um, was from the Bittersweet magazine where these high school students, again, went out and interviewed actual people in the region. And it really gives you a good picture on the ground uh, of what people are willing to share and what people are willing to talk about in terms of um, their folk practices. And it's not just folk magic, it's everything. So you get really good interviews with the people of the region, so you get to know them. It's not something that you just sit there and mine for um, magical lore, that that's stuff that you'll find, and it's wonderful. Um, but you can also find a lot out about what it was like to live in that region at the time. And this is uh, largely recorded in the late 60s through the 70s. So it does help bridge the gap between Randolph and Weston as well. So that can give you a good kind of complete, you know, you get almost 100 years uh, of history taken all together. Uh, you get, you know, 75 to 100 years worth of good history and regional folk practices, regional ways and things like that. And you get a really good sense of some of the magic that is in the area and how it's being practiced. Um, how it's being disseminated to future generations, and sometimes how it's being lost uh, to future generations too. And then how do people stop that from happening? How do they um, keep a hold on, on that material as well? So that's just kind of a brief overview of the Ozarks. Hopefully that gives you some sense of what this region is like. So much really rich history, so much rich magic in this area. Highly recommend checking out the sources that I've mentioned in this video please do uh, take a look at those uh, and and see if they strike you as something that you want to learn more about. I think it's really, really great. Um, even if you're not necessarily going to put into practice something that you learn from studying somebody else's magical system, because sometimes you shouldn't, sometimes it belongs to them, but sometimes it's really great to learn about somebody else's culture and somebody else's magical practices. And then think about like, how does that connect to your own? Do you see similarities? Do you see parallels? Um, do you see something that that sort of resonates with you in a way that reminds you of things that maybe you grew up with or things that you have seen around you in your own kind of cultural setting um, that you might be able to use? So I think it's a really valuable thing to do. Hopefully this is valuable to you. Uh, if it is, please feel free to subscribe to the channel. 
um, come subscribe to the podcast as well. We talk about this kind of stuff all the time there too. And yeah, I hope this is helpful to some folks and leads you in a fun direction to discover some more North American folk magic, which is what we're all about here. Thanks for watching. Be well. Thank you.